The world is shaping up for a revolution in aviation innovation. In the UK, businesses are already creating new, innovative, greener air transport solutions designed to offer more choice and reduce our carbon footprint. The Future Flight Challenge from UK Research and Innovation aims to create the aviation system of the future, allowing us to improve transport links between regions and in remote areas to connect people to education, jobs and healthcare. Our £125 million investment will allow the UK to build, use and export new transport technologies and be at the forefront of aviation innovation. We're bringing together industry experts to carry out research, development and demonstrations to solve mobility challenges in the UK. By encouraging innovators from a wide variety of sectors to work together, the projects we fund will help shape novel aviation approaches to enable the safe operation of radically new aircraft. Using drones to offer alternative ways of delivering goods and services, both in highly populated and remote areas. Carrying out offshore maintenance and surveillance for the renewable energy sector. The delivery of medical supplies. Surveying buildings after a fire or collapse to reduce the risk to human life. Or post-incident filming for evidence gathering. Using new and sustainable fuel sources to lower carbon emissions from advanced air mobility vehicles and electric or hybrid aircraft to help address the mobility and congestion problems in urban areas and improve travel connections for rural communities where the development of ground infrastructure is difficult. These new modes of air transport will combine in a coordinated airspace where scheduled and on-demand flights work together to move people, goods and services. To enable widespread safe use of autonomous and electric air vehicles, Future Flight will bring together advanced technologies with control and regulation, physical and digital infrastructure systems, and new operating models. This new environment will be a catalyst for businesses to invest in the UK, as we shape the global future of aviation and create a truly integrated aviation system. With a truly all-inclusive approach, Future Flight is transformational and will change our lives. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Future Flight Friday, where we will be discussing a sustainable aviation flight path. Um, with COP26 now just days away, uh, we hope you enjoy the session and you find it a valuable introduction to, to how Future Flight is supporting net zero ambitions. So before we get started, I'm just going to run you through a very quick agenda. Following this introduction, uh, Gary Kurtz, Future Flight Challenge Director, will be giving us an overview of the Future Flight Challenge and sustainability. We'll then open into a panel discussion with Gary and Tanya Siggs, who is the Institute of Aerospace Technology Programme Manager at the University of Nottingham, who are also a consortium member of 2.0. Um, you might notice that we're slightly light on the ground um, on panellists today. Um, this is a short notice change of plan, um, but we hope that you'll bear with us and you'll enjoy the session anyway. We'll then have a brief Q&A um, before closing the sessions um, with some next steps for the Future Flight Programme. So without further ado, I will hand over to Gary Cutts. Thank you very much. Super, thank you very much. Um, so this morning, uh, this afternoon even now, I want to just give a little bit of an introduction to our thinking around sustainability. I'm going to dive into two or three slides that we've talked about quite a lot when we introduced the roadmap strategy and vision for Future Flight but I'm not going to deliver them in the same way we normally do. I just want to use them to bring out a few specific points around sustainability, I guess. Uh, and, and also I'm going to do them in a different order to what we normally do for a particular reason. So if I can jump to the first slide, please. Um, so this is what we presented as our consumer vision for future flight. Uh, and it is a you know, very broad vision. We talk about there being three classes of new types of air vehicles drones, air mobility, and what we call regional air mobility uh, services. And for us, they provide a wide range of uh, new benefits to society, Tom, from better connectivity, uh, seamless and fully integrated journeys, 
Ideally, uh, improved affordability as well, the electric aviation offers the potential for significant cost reductions. So there's a wide variety of things on this complex slide. And as I said, this morning uh, is, a, is a fairly simple presentation. I'm not walking around the entire slide, but I just want to give a reminder there are a number of benefits. But this starts to get at the heart of one of the things we talked about early on in the future flight. And one of the key points I want to leave us with before we start into the questions is, we can see future flight as broadly splitting into two uh, benefit streams. One is it's part of a large decarbonisation sustainability agenda, and it's on the journey to uh, aviation becoming a decarbonised transport mode. A really challenging thing to do, but one that we know we all wish to achieve. Secondly, uh, we could see it as um, frankly put sustainability to one side, and it's creating a new range of exciting products. Uh, the press is really interested in these types of air vehicles. We're really interested in the new use cases and the services to which they're put. So at a level, future flight is the, wow, you know, look, look what's coming your way soon, a whole new range of services. Early on in the challenge, with those two ways of describing it, I, I found that quite often uh, you kind of picked one, depending on the audience. You ended up talking about it being a very, very sensible uh, part of the path to sustainability in aviation. Other audiences, we almost didn't play that down, but it was much more about, look, these are the new things that you'll be able to do with drones. It's really obvious that for us, future flight is both of those. You know, they're, they're completely intertwined. Uh, and this chart speaks to that. When you look at the consumer vision of what people should expect to have in 2030, it is a range of new services. It is improved accessibility for people. It is connecting, difficult to connect to places. Uh, as, as part of the government's agenda to encourage connectivity across the entire UK. But also, it is about sustainability. And we always said we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to push with any integrity future flight to create new air vehicle usage if they weren't inherently zero carbon as well. So we kind of learned to live with this challenge being about both and try to stop talking about neither or. And we think there's a really wonderful opportunity in future flight to still be creating new products and new services have the public really excited about the emergence of technology to do new things for them, but that that new technology is inherently green at birth and is sustainable. So it's kind of we can take out some of the guilt that we might feel about wanting to do new and improved things. So that's about the consumer vision. I jump forward a uh, slide, please. Uh, and then when we talked about uh, the, the wider industry vision, and again, I'm not planning on walking around this today. We've done that many times. All those videos are available. There are lots of things that the industry needs to put in place to realise our vision of future flight. Everything from regulations to the safety systems, to the security, the connectivity between different modes of transport, uh, our wonderful technically challenging new air traffic management and airspace concepts, a wide range of things that the industry needs to put together to enable this. But we always come back to uh, the wide definition of sustainability being on the agenda top left. So we see that the it's not only that the consumer's vision of what they'd like to do in the future has to include sustainability, but the way that industry approaches that vision has to have sustainability front and centre. Now, it, it's quite timely because I had the joy of joining an event yesterday at Glasgow Airport, a sort of pre-COP26 event. Uh, so it's all the benefits of talking about really interesting stuff, but without so much traffic and so many people on the streets. But we joined a session uh, with uh, Ferruvial, um, Vertical Aerospace and Lilium as two aircraft manufacturers, talking about their joint plans to develop Vertiports uh, in the UK uh, as a, a means to accelerate the use of air mobility vehicles. But what you'd have picked up from the panel session we did yesterday, for everybody on the panel, the criticality of that also being seen as sustainable so that we're not adding to the problem. And then that being part of this flight path to sustainability that we are pulling along the aviation industry and we're doing some zero carbon flight relatively early. So that industry vision, it's clear to me when you talk and listen to industry, they understand that small piece on here about sustainability, a wider definition of sustainability has to sit front and center in all the exciting new things that we do. And then if I jump to the last one, this is where I've done these completely backwards to how we normally present them. Really the stuff that's driving the things like future flight anyway. This goes back to our very first roadmap session where we said, so we're 
we're here, we've decided to launch money and innovation, but let's take a step back and say, what's going on in the world? What is it that people want to do? What are the societal, economic, um, and just the wide scale drivers in the world at large that are creating a, a need and acceptance or a desire for things like future flight? And we thought these things were quite important. So um, we've got sustainability again. That is clearly an existential crisis. And every part of our industry needs to think about how do they play their part in achieving zero carbon and at probably a faster pace than we have been doing so far. So it sits front and center. But then you look at other things in here. You've got the, the concepts of um, kind of hyper convenience of people wanting things instantly, a demand for I order something online and you know, I'd like it to arrive at my door kind of three minutes later. That, that's absolutely a trend. You know, we can't be in denial and say the world is only talking about zero carbon. It isn't. It's looking for hyper convenience and speed. We're looking for on demand and fully integrated services. We are looking at ways in which particularly digital technologies and autonomy and robotics and things can come into our lives. So for us, all of those demands are going on in parallel. And again, why I've done this the wrong way up today, you can see that for us as a future flight challenge, why it's imperative that we are creating new services, we are taking technology to the market and enabling things to happen that previously couldn't, but that that is part of a new set of sustainable services. So the two things are kind of intimately linked. And I just wanted to kind of set that scene. It's not an either or for us. Uh, and I'm going to be upbeat and positive. It is fantastic that we can still create, still keep creating and introducing new goods and services to the world. It's not just that we have to stop and use less. We kind of do, but we can still do new different things if we think about sustainability from the outset. So my very final slide, if I can jump forward, please, is just to talk about um, the benefits and how we sold them. Now, this is a real high-level summary slide. Future Flight paper that launched the thing with government in the first place is pretty extensive. Uh, there's a lot of words in there. There's lots of tables and charts and economics. And what I try to do is boil down the, the why. Why is the government supporting future flight? What are the big objectives and deliverables out of it? Uh, and in the end, I think they come down to three areas. Um, honestly, I think people, depending on their perspective, tend to believe one of these is the only one that matters. We as a challenge don't. We think the whole thing matters. So firstly, we're doing future flight because we think there are societal benefits, but what we're doing has meaning for people. So it is clearly part of uh, the sustainable flight roadmap. It is definitely about better connectivity to people. That is distributed aviation systems, concepts of multimodal transport, remote deliveries, connecting difficult to connect places in the UK and beyond. And doing all of that gives productivity. So it is, a, it is a worthwhile thing. We really believe that when we deliver the Future Flight Challenge and all of the organisations that are part of it deliver that bigger ecosystem, society is in a better place. There's a whole slug of things there that are important to us. The middle part on here is sort of more hard-nosed economic, if you like, that that will create new industries. It will position the UK uh, as a place that develops these technologies, catalyze UK investment, create inward investment to the UK, but then it will create business opportunities around passenger services, the delivery, um, the, uh, the logistics operation of these new aviation systems, but even around the regulation of standards, there are economic opportunities to become the place that develops and sells these standards. And then obviously there are aircraft and aircraft products in the mix as well. So absolutely, Future Flight is looking to be a GDP multiplier and create new industries. But again, and last point, I'm, last time I'm going to say this, but only if they are coming with you know, uh, benefits to society and they're sustainable. So there are two things I've talked about at length on all of these slides. The last one for us is kind of a subtle one. I've always believed passionately in this, but it's sort of a soft power thing, that eventually it will be quite hard to prove what impact we had. But because the aircraft we are developing from drones to air mobility, they are electric or in some cases hydrogen, but they're smaller, they're faster moving, they're coming to the market quicker. So if we were to sit waiting for a true zero carbon aircraft in a 200 seat size, we're going to be waiting for quite a while. Um, uh, and either we can sit waiting for that and then spread that out, or we can get going. We can work in the aircraft space where things can be done quickly. 
and we just get that zero carbon system up and running. So for us, Future Flight is also about early zero carbon flight and systems demonstration. It is about supporting new entrants and building new partnerships. I've no doubt I'll repeat this when we get into the Q&A. That to us, we think is really powerful that we have a really well-established aviation industry in the UK, you know, some really significant oiled players. Um, yet we think introducing them or encouraging them to work with new entrants, new technology companies, that's probably the kind of furnace where these new systems get forged, if you like, that will develop new thinking. So bringing all of that stuff together, this third soft power dimension of future flight that we are trying to accelerate um, new forms of decarbonized and sustainable flight because we're a place we can do that a little bit. Um, there's less risk in doing that in the aircraft we're doing. There's an ability to go somewhat faster. There's an ability to use future flight as a test bed to prototype and develop ideas. So I think we will act eventually as an accelerator that encourages the big aviation system to decarbonize. We're not decarbonizing the big aviation system. We're part of the ecosystem. Hence why I say that we see future flight as being on that wider flight path to decarbonisation, although we're not doing it all ourselves. Um, so thanks very much. That was uh, my introduction to the topics today. Thank you very much, Gary. <clears throat> and your contact details are, are just on the screen if anyone wants to follow up that discussion. Um, so now we're going to move into the panel discussion and I'll um, welcome Tanya um, into, into the room as well. So to kind of put a frame around this, <clears throat> Global airlines have committed to reaching net zero carbon emissions by 2050. And we've seen the development of the Jet Zero Council through the Department for Transport, which is hoped to be a catalyst for zero emission flights across the Atlantic by around 2040. They're expecting demonstrators. Um, it's widely acknowledged that to enable these technologies, a basket of measures will be required from mandates, sustainable aviation fuels through to hydrogen um, and electric technologies. Through this panel, we're hoping to understand how future flight projects are supporting that net zero ambition and how technologies delivered within the challenge can support commitments that we've seen within the commercial aviation sector. So I'm going to give Gary a little bit of a breath um, after that uh, panel um, introduction and introduce Tanya. Um, so Tanya, Nottingham University are involved with 2.0, which looks at system-wide changes necessary for future operations of hybrid electric aircraft. That includes new standards, certification, airport infrastructure, and management for renewable ground power. How do you see this work um, contributing to the wider Jet Zero ambitions? Yes, thanks, Hannah, and good morning, uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. Yes, yeah, so in terms of the 2.0 project, um, as you say, there's quite an ecosystem of different organisations involved. Um, and in terms of the Jet Zero ambitions, I think there are sort of really sort of two key strands. So one, obviously, is the real sort of decarbonisation thrust. Um, but the second one is also that sort of um, preserving the benefits of air transportation. Um, and I think that's something that, you know, cuts across in terms of the 2.0 project. Um, in, in, in quite sort of stark sort of uh, detail there, because I think we're really focused on the benefits of aviation um, for the Southwest region. That's where 2.0 is predominantly um, focusing its efforts. Um, and I think it's really important to understand that, yes, there are these huge pressures on the sector to decarbonise, um, you know, obviously, with, like you say, with COP26 starting next week, um, you know, we know that we all have an obligation to, to try and meet those uh, net zero targets. Um, but we mustn't lose sight of the benefits of, of air transportation. And also, um, as Gary uh, mentioned in his uh, presentation, um, the, the many benefits that air transport brings um, and the, the opportunities for new products, new services, new ways of operating um, for a number of different parties. So um, that is something within the 2.0 project partnership where we see um, you know, startup um, aerospace companies, we see airports, airlines, um, also the local authorities, um, energy infrastructure providers, and also the university obviously sort of really working uh, together to sort of visualize this new aviation system and really look at the challenges that we're going to have to, to, to create it and make it reality. Um, and I think that's something at, at Nottingham in terms of the 2.0 project, really looking at the modeling and simulation of, of what this all looks like to really achieve sort of real life, real world scenarios that answer the questions that we're getting from the airlines, from the airports, um, from the aircraft manufacturers in terms of how this will all 
um, you know, come into sort of being. Um, and I think that's where we sort of, um, you know, sort of uh, run in parallel with the jet zero ambitions there with uh, the decarbonisation and the, uh, the, the um, preserving the benefits of air transportation. Brilliant, thank you. And, and as you say, it's all about collaboration. Um, the COP26 goals are quite clear that we can only rise to the challenge of the climate crisis by working together. Um, Gary, I'm interested to understand how Future Flight's convening um, the players and the technologies to, to support delivering net zero by 2050. Yeah, that's a really good question. And convening people has been one of the, the challenges we, we had throughout this. And if you like, our thoughts have developed early on because our focus was on, as we said several times, new forms of aviation, right at the infancy of that industry. Um, you know, drones have been around for a while, but in terms of widespread usage, still at the infancy. So our view of convening was, you really, um, you're helping to create a new ecosystem, and therefore, you know, you're having to bring people in before they know they need to be brought in to it. Uh, and, and I would say that's, that's something I think we did a pretty good job of a future flight. Uh, we're not they get blowing our own trumpet, but that's pretty well done. But I would say that uh, the industry was in the right frame of mind to do that. So actually, people were looking to form those early ecosystems, and that's been quite good. The bit that's uh, emerged from that is we see, again, um, a number of players who are making that connection forward into bigger aviation transformation. So we've kind of convened people in one arena. They are connected to or they have aspirations to take the learning on into the big aviation. So I do think that we've have, we have helped, and I'm, I'm going to stop my sales pitch there, help convene a bigger industry. What I will say is, and I think this has changed in the last two, maybe the last three years in my perspective, uh, I think you're seeing some of the bigger players now uh, know that collaboration is everything. And if you are, uh, it, is, it is natural, if you're an established um, organization and you have a particular place in the ecosystem, uh, step one is to maintain that position and, uh, and, and and fight off all competition. I think that dynamic has changed. I think you see a lot of collaborative flavour in big aviation and big aerospace now of people saying, right, this has to be done collectively. How do we work together? So um, I guess my answer was, well, Future Flight did a bit of that in our space. We've encouraged some of that thinking. We've always been advocates of people working together in non-traditional ways. But I do think that the whole industry now is looking to partner in other ways. I think there's more to come and we'll probably come back to that in future questions because I, my personal perspective would be that the, if you like, the technical part of the ecosystem is now starting to engage uh, between you know, um, infrastructure providers, digital providers, OEMs of equipment. Uh, is there more to do? There is. So in the areas of policy and economics, so we could talk about things like taxation, I still think there was a wider conversation bring people together to create a total roadmap for decarbonisation. Brilliant, thanks Gary. And uh, yes, collaboration and, and convening those stakeholders will continue kind of past this initial phase three deadline and uh, we hope to, to support the Future Flight Challenge as KTN with that. So I actually went to um, the ADS's pre-COP26 event this week and they were talking through about collaboration the whole way through, but what they were also talking about was the importance of SAF. I'm interested, Tanya, to, to get your opinion um, as a project that's looking into hybrid electric. Um, what, where do you see the importance of hybrid electric um, supporting sustainable aviation fuels in the future? Yes, absolutely. I think I think SAF is such a, a major topic and obviously it's, it's, it's so important. I mean, I mean, in terms of the sort of the more conventional um, aerospace sector as, as we know it now, um, you know, SAF does provide, you know, a, a, a really, you know, obvious and, and, and clear way to, to start to decarbonise um, with the current infrastructure that we already have. Um, but I, I do see that, you know, SAF can then, particularly here, I'm focusing very much on the hybrid electric um, sort of aircraft. Uh, you, you do have the sort of, um, particularly if they've got parallel um, combustion architecture as well um you know you can actually switch to saf um or saf blend um so i, I see i mean obviously with the two zero project it's what you know it's very focused on a on small aircraft um but in, in terms of saf it's it's definitely um, a combination of of uh, technologies um that that could actually work very well together um and it's something that you know obviously for the for the larger aircraft the airlines you know it's something that it's being addressed on a, on a global level that whole 
scenario of, of the demand and supply of, of SAF fuel. Um, it's definitely not an either or. I think, as, as Gary sort of mentioned earlier, um, there are so many different technologies in the mix here, as we see with the Future Flight Challenge. Um, and, you know, some areas you are starting small, for example, with the hybrid electric aircraft. Um, and in other areas, you are trying to um, make sort of conventional um, sort of current aircraft uh, more efficient and more effective um, th through a range of different technologies and, and applications. So it's something here where I think um, with SAF that, you know, we see, and again, as, as Gary has said earlier, about things like policy changes, taxation, carbon credits, things like that, that there is this sort of dual kind of push-pull um, factor in terms of, you know, creating this, the, the environment for um, producers of different sort of fuels to uh, to know that they have the, the confidence to to invest in production because they know there's going to be an end market. Um, and I think SAF provides options not just for smaller hybrid electric aircraft uh, fleets, but obviously also for, for, the, for the, the current major airlines that we, we see um, every day. If I, um, Hannah, maybe I could come into that to, to Tanya's points. I mean, very well made points, um, Tanya. Um, it, to me, and I, I become a more strong advocate of this, the most important thing is that people don't think they have to make a decision too quickly and treat the world as kind of an either or. Um, um, it, it is interesting. Um, if you post anything in this space on LinkedIn, and I'm sure other social networks are available and probably much worse on this, you tend to get really opinionated views really quickly. Uh, I'm pretty sure if I posted something this afternoon and said hydrogen's the answer, lots of people would tell me hydrogen is definitely not the answer. It's a complete stupid waste of people's money and, and people would have the opposite views. So, um, so there's sort of a plea to our, um, our natures in this as well. We all have to learn to not think a decision has to be made on that stuff right now. So there's a technical reason why you want to keep your options open and work things forward, but there's sort of an emotional reason as well. This is not, it's not a game. It's not about hydrogen people proving staff people wrong and vice versa. So um, we don't know what the winning uh, solutions will be. Honestly, I think it will be all of the things we've talked about in some combination, and it may well change over time. So it may well be, and SAF clearly is a really important um, near-term technology and particularly for long haul that is that's the only realistic way of doing something large scale in the near term it may well be in 50 years and uh, probably probably future flight will have ended by then it may be in 50 years that's utterly irrelevant and it's hydrogen or it may well be in 20 years time there's a level of um, electricity storage technology that we don't even call batteries there's something else entirely because electrons don't weigh an awful lot and suddenly everything will be electric so all the people who tell you that it could never be electric, could never be hydrogen, it's definitely SAF, they all may be right or wrong at the same time. So it's just we just need to keep all of these things alive. And I think learn to be really open minded and stop trying to close down the debate too early on these things. SAF's important uh, and, and others will be too. I, I think if I, I can come in as well on um, a further point, maybe is you know, some of us are very used to the sort of the big, um, you know, hub and spoke airline operations, you know, very, very large airports or cities, city scale, um, you know, air connectivity. Um, but obviously, you know, across the whole globe, but also very much from a UK perspective, you know, we have different ge geographies across the UK and you have, you know, sort of things like your island, um, island areas and more remote disconnected areas. Um, and, and really, you know, we're not really looking at sort of uh, 80 to 200 seat aircraft here. Um, even, you know, a, a nine seat passenger aircraft is something that um, can, can really provide, um, you know, vital services and vital connectivity um, to these communities. And, and I think, uh, as you say, with a sort of either hybrid electric or SAF or other, other propulsion um, systems, um, you know, we have to think about the whole mix of, of aircraft and air fleets and um, different geographies as well that are being served. Um, so as you say, it's, um, it, it is always a mix because there are different aircraft craft types uh, and different aircraft sizes as well. Thank you both. And, and that's why it's so important to keep our, our options open. And I think that's what the Future Flight Challenge is doing brilliantly, but also supported by the Jet Zero Council. You know, we've got a SAF strand, but there's also a technology strand. And I think by industry working together, <clears throat> not having boxed off opinions of what's possible and what's not possible, that's what will, will enable um, those ambitions to, to become reality in the future. Um, so thank you both for, for those thoughts. Um, 
I'm also interested to, to understand maybe, Gary, this is kind of trying to narrow down those thoughts on technology slightly more, um, but where you see the critical challenges for sustainable aviation and maybe um, what you think should be addressed as a top priority, not necessarily technologies, um, but policy as well, and potentially by whom, if you're, if you're able to address that. It, it, I mean, definitely a very broad question. We could we could spend the next hour kind of uh, talking about points in that area. From from a um, infrastructure technology point of view, I'm going to make a point. I think everyone gets, but it's really important: is that the, the infrastructure, the energy sources, and generally genuinely creating clean energy provide the systems really important. I think people get that now, but it's a useful reminder um, that that many of us with an aerospace background, you, you've got to fix the aircraft, you've got to enable it to fly clean. As soon as you've done that, you've got to get some source of putting that clean energy into it. So I think that is now understood. Uh, and it's uh, We see the right kinds of people engaging in that debate now. And certainly in future flight, um, um, the, um, the two zero project that Tanya's on is a really good example. You're seeing all of those people part, right? I think you have an energy provider in that project. Uh, considering you know energy sources for for the aircraft in the future, so that's really important. Um, I will come back and, and again, this is uh, a personal view. Um, I think we have to start evolving you know clear policies guidelines, um, probably from government on you know what's the right usage of various technologies. Uh, I want to give a couple of examples here, and this is not meant to be definitive. Um, number one, I think we should give guidance on where we're supporting aviation. Um, or how we see aviation being used. So aviation is, uh, is, is a transport mechanism, you know, apart from our kind of use for you know, visualisation, surveillance and so on with drones. Fundamentally, it's a transport uh, mechanism. It is not the only transport mechanism. It's part of a huge, great transport ecosystem. So the very worst thing we could do is, um, frankly, spend a lot of time, energy and money decarbonising part of the flight system when actually it just makes sense to chuck stuff on a train instead. So I think we have to engage with the wider transport system and work out the right way to use aviation. And there's definitely a place for aviation. It, it clearly has a huge part in that ecosystem. And I think that kind of area, you know, governments and others just thinking about policies and usage and where do you want to encourage it and where do you send signals that that may not be the right thing to do is important. I hinted at this before, uh, the world at large, it's not a UK issue, is going to have to start to think about pure economics and taxation systems. Uh, interestingly, you've seen the budget this year in the UK a couple of days ago. There was a air passenger duty kind of came off short haul flights and a new class went on extremely long haul flights. Um, to me, it would be when we can get clean or cleaner flight, heavily decarbonized, if not completely net zero. Well, I think that would be the point at which you would take all taxation off that and maybe more taxation on heavy polluting. So there is government economic encouragement as well. And I'm talking not just UK, but globally. So you get those kind of big policy dimensions as well. Uh, and I guess the final area for me is that we collectively need to continue to engage with the non-aviation industry, if you like, because ultimately um, traveling public or the public that orders goods that come on aircraft, they determine demand in this system. And we just need to have a really sophisticated and honest conversation with the public to work things through. And what I mean by that is, um, ultimately, um, no one in this industry creates demand. Demand is created by people who to a first order and nothing to do with this industry, don't understand it and kind of don't care. So will people want to uh, fly? Um, handled um, uh, badly. Um, we could be creating a green system that's not perceived as that, and the public walks away from aviation. Um, um, and, you know, handle well, we could do something much better. So we have to engage, and that's not really a government policy per se. That's a, an honest industry conversation that treats the social use of aviation and how the public sees it as being just as important a part of conversation as the technical solutions to flying green. I hope that answers a few of the, the points. No, definitely. Thank you. Oh, Tanya, I can see that. Did you want to say something then? To... No, no, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, you touched on public perception there, Gary. Interested to, to hear both of your thoughts on this, but what part do you think public perception plays into demand? And how do you think that the Future Flight Challenge and projects that are happening now um, and in phase three can support that demand and an understanding of the communities that will be impacted by Future Flight? Maybe I'll open up to Gary first. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, so I mean, a really broad question. I'll describe some of the things we're starting to do. We, we have um, a social science research director now, um, uh, and uh, uh, Fern from University of Birmingham. Uh, Fern is kind of fabulous, and she starts to do heavy engagement in this area now. Um, and what's obvious, and Fern could obviously explain much better than I can, it's not a simple question of kind of public perception, what's the public think? You're getting into, well, why does the public think that? Ultimately, uh, how will the public use these services? For what purpose? How do they perceive them? So it's not a um, trying to influence how people think it's a marketing thing. It's something so much deeper than that about what really is the utility of flying. So Fern, uh, Fern is leading a whole piece of work to engage yet further with people. Um, I do think, and I'm slightly at a tangent here, but I'm, I'm going to repeat something I kind of said yesterday at the forum we were at. It is also about not being too defensive where we are able to create new forms of flight and they are sustainable. We, we, we should be happy to go talk about that. And um, so we're trying to change the, the narrative from uh, public acceptance, which sort of implies you don't really like this, but we'll talk you into liking it enough to kind of public desirability that this, you know, if you can create green, true green aircraft, I want one of those. I've got a fixed amount of money. I would prefer to go and fly and do something green than do something that's not aviation, that's not flying. So we don't want to be too defensive as well. I think we want to go and engage with the public. And the very final thought I have, and a huge you know, topic we could explore further, as we start to do things and the public starts to see them, and there's no doubt lots of future flight stuff makes the press. Two zero, another good example. It's had a lot of press coverage. Um, the, the, the use cases there, having a media conversation about the use cases being sensible, worthy things to do. I, I cringe, and I, I know from comments other people made yesterday, uh, every time somebody talks about flying cars and they show a picture of a car with wings and there's a, there's a kind of perception about this being a really niche, high net worth individual who just wants to turn their Lamborghini into a flying Lamborghini. And we do, so we need to kind of help media kind of dump that narrative and say, no, what we're doing, they are socially useful things. That pulls people into the conversation uh, of desirability. Thank you. You're brilliant. Thank you. And and Tanya, I suppose this kind of falls into the importance of engaging with different stakeholders at this stage in future flight. So where do you see the importance of engaging with local authorities and, and their role in, in supporting the ambitions of future flight? Oh, yes, I think that's absolutely fundamental. I mean, we're really fortunate in the Two Zero project project to have really strong engagement and support from um, the local authorities and also the local economic partnership um, in the southwest of England. Um, we have the what they call the heart of the southwest local economic partnership um, is, a, is a full partner in the project. Um, and I think that real sort of place based focus where you know, obviously, as a two zero project, we are working with partners at uh, Cornwall Newquay Airport and Exeter Airport. So that obviously gives a very sort of, uh, you know, geographic, uh, you know, real focus to the geography. But I think having that perspective from the local authorities um, and also from the local economic partnership um, really brings in the ambitions of the area, but also the, the needs of the area as well. Um, obviously, in the southwest, they're really focused on clean growth, um, particularly on clean aviation growth as well. The southwest is a is a major aerospace um, has a major aerospace cluster, um, and I think it's so important for when you have meetings with local councillors, um, with the county council, with the economic partnership. Um, you know, these are people who. Um, engage with their local communities directly and so they can feed those views back to for example us into the two zero partnership directly um, but it's also a really good conduit back out to the to the local communities um, so that there is an awareness that this activity is happening because as, as as gary said earlier it can seem quite niche obviously this is a sector we are all involved with we're all really passionate about um, but for a lot of people um, um, out in the local communities this is this is not something they're they're aware of, um, even though there has been good publicity obviously of the Future Flight Challenge and including the Two Zero project. Um, but the more we can have with things like the demonstrators, with media coverage, uh, with the local authorities, and that real place based focus, um, that really starts to bring it to life to people. They really see that it's it's real, it's happening. Um, it you know there's as they say you know when you see it you believe it, and I think that is what's so important about having that place based focus. Thank you, Tanya. I completely agree. And I can see Gary nodding, nodding along there as well. Um, so just to wrap up 
the, the panel discussion part of, of this session. I want to, to finish on kind of a, a broader question talking about the technologies that are being developed through the Future Flight Challenge. Um, so Gary, I'll come to you and Tanya, please, if you have any kind of things that you want to add to, to Gary's answer, please jump in. Um, how do you see Future Flight Challenge's role in advancing technologies that support um, net zero ambitions? Are there any technologies in particular? Um, and also, I suppose, past phase three, how do you see um, the network of Future Flight engaging with wider networks that support this ambition to, to commercialize and develop their technologies? Yeah, let, let me, uh, and definitely a really broad question. I, I, I'm going to limit it a little for time. So on the, the, the technologies part, there are lots of technologies. Um, and we talked about decarbonisation technologies and infrastructure of uh, zero carbon energy and so on. Um, I'm, I'm just going to pick a slightly different one, and this is takes us beyond future flight as well. I think ultimately the role of um, digital um, and the role of you know, associated digital technologies and to some degree autonomy and robotics, which goes a bit further. I think we're still scratching the surface of how do we use that data so the opportunity to create a really slick end-to-end -end system uh, of transport requires each individual transport element to work, but it requires that um, uh, kind of the interfaces and the planning and the logistics to be right. So you're not flying empty aircraft in stupid places. You're not having deadhead legs. How do you how do you use that wider transport system? So uh, every kind of square inch, every kilogram of payload availability is used all the time. So I, I think there's a we're not heavily into that future flight, but technology will come later, that sophisticated digital planning systems. And again, I'll refer that back to, we really need to continue to be supportive of a total transport system and not see aviation trying to drag people off trains or vice versa. They should look at how do they work together. So there's that kind of syncopation of that system working together requires a digital system as well. So that's a big one. Uh, to your second point, um, I, I've always seen, we talk about this a lot, Future flight. Um, we use future flight in two ways. To us, future flight challenge is the challenge. It's the team of kind of eight people who live and breathe it. It's all of our supporting partners, uh, KTN, uh, the catapults, and so on. It's that, but it's it's much more than that. It's kind of it's a program of activity that really is owned by wider industry that will continue for years to come. So actually, for us, we we absolutely see some of the things that we are encouraging and starting. They need to continue probably for at least 10 years post the end of the challenge, which is planned to be March 2024. So, um, and this, uh, um, I'll, I'll leave you with a thought about KTN. So KTN's role as a, as, a, as a convener, bringing together industry and causing a conversation, that kind of industry keeping together, carrying on with this conversation, that will be really critical when the challenge is probably closed down as a challenge in a few years' time. So yeah, industry, this is the start of it, <clears throat> continuing to work together, to deliver the roadmap is really important. Brilliant, thank you, Gary. Um, and yes, I completely agree. KTN has a significant role at the end of the challenge to continue bringing those stakeholders together and, and supporting them with opportunities past future flight, who they should be communicating with and, and sharing their technologies. Um, so thank you very much for that panel discussion. I think it's been really informative and great to understand <clears throat> the synergies and also where future flight deviates from commercial aviation and, and our opportunities within future flight. We're going to open now for a QA and a um, for another 20 minutes of the session. Um, we have had a few different questions coming through from our audience, so thank you very much. Please feel free to continue posting your questions in the chat. My colleague Matthew Moss is moderating that for you today. Um, so Gary, um, this one is for you. Um, do you see that cryogenic hydrogen hybrid electric could solve sub-regional space before we see it in fly zero um, or larger aircraft um, as an extender potentially for EV tolls? Uh, gosh, that, that's a really uh, deep question. I think I'm going to say the answer is potentially to be decided because the fly zero team is continuing to work. Uh, they, as you'll have seen, see cryogenic hydrogen has been a really attractive solution. And I think they see it as potentially can extend quite a long way up. And that's not all previous studies have come to the same conclusion, saying that's, a, that's a, a possible thing to do. I don't think we've settled on the right entry point to that yet. So the entry point could be, um, I'm going to use aircraft names, it could be an A320 kind of size or an A220 where you, you go in there. 
on the grounds that that's got volume. It's where the major players with money exist. It's where the infrastructure providers can come in, and that's the way to get it kick-started. Um, uh, and therefore, it will cascade uh, upwards into larger, and eventually, it might become smaller. It is plausible that that's a really expensive, really complex way to go about it. Uh, and actually, the better thing to do is take the what we would call sub-regional all-electric aircraft that we are supporting and believing, and that the first application of cryogenics is exactly there. So, and again, I'm, I'm picking numbers completely out of the air. It may be you want to go to a 70-seater, 300 nautical mile range. That's a great place to go. I think the jury is out on that journey. So it's certainly possible that these aircraft are a good place to go. Uh, and we'll let Fly Zero finish and work out the roadmap from there. Thank you, Gary. Um, very diplomatic. Um, so, Tanya, this, this next question is for you. I think um, the audience are quite interested to understand how academics like Nottingham University collaborate with industries like SMEs, um, for example. I know that 2.0 isn't the only um, challenge or project that university um, work on. So it'd be great to kind of understand a little bit more about how you do collaborate both across the Future Flight Challenge and, and beyond as well. Yes, this is a really great question. And <clears throat> excuse me, absolutely everything, you know, is about sort of, you know, trying to get, you know, that, that knowledge transfer, as you were saying about the, the KTN as well, you know, universities also have a major duty to, to, to make sure that that knowledge is transferred out into, um, into industry, but also into society as well. Um, and if we take Nottingham as, a, as an example, um, we're very fortunate that we've, uh, we've had quite a lot of success in the, uh, the European Union Clean Sky Programme. Um, and the reason why this is so key for Nottingham is because of the scale of it, but also because it, it really helps us to tap into uh, major industry partners. So this is really where we're focusing on more, more of the larger um, sort of aerospace industry um, companies. Um, you know, you can create that, that relationship, you can create that trust, um, and then that either feeds into new um, sort of uh, publicly funded uh, joint research or sometimes even bilateral research. Um, so the funding is really helpful to sort of often sort of just trigger those partnerships and get people working together and then help universities to sort of uh, link in with um, the relevant companies um, and build that trust and, and build those relationships to work on future challenges as well. Um, and in particular, then also for SMEs, um, at Nottingham, we actually support, um, it's a co-partnered um, project with the Midlands Aerospace Alliance. Um, and for those not familiar with, with England, there's a, a region called the Midlands. Um, and we support with the Midlands Aerospace Alliance, uh, we support aerospace supply chain companies um, to either, you know, develop new products, um, new services for the aerospace sector, um, to sort of also with student placements, that's a really key thing as well to try and get, it's not just the research we do with our with our academics and our research teams, um, but also getting our students into um, SMEs and also larger companies as well um, to, to really sort of work on real world challenges um, and current challenges as well. Um, so, so these are sort of two examples where we see how um, universities like Nottingham do engage uh, with the aerospace sector, whether that's the uh, the SMEs uh, in the aerospace supply chain, um, the larger industry um, companies as well. Um, you know that we were obviously it's Nottingham. We're lucky that we have Rolls Royce very close by, uh, so we have very long standing relationship with them. Um, but we also through uh, different um, areas of collaboration, we work across. Um, many different aerospace companies um, from the UK, but also from Europe and, and the wider world as well. Brilliant, thank you, Tanya. And yes, it, I think that quite often um, SMEs or, or other organisations um, find it hard reaching out to universities. That's why KTN are here. Um, we're here to convene and, and support you in making those introductions. So if there is anyone um, who is either an academic and wants support in accessing SMEs or organisations to partner with or the other way around, please do reach out to us at KTN and, and we're here to, to support that and those introductions moving forward, as well as, I suppose, um, the dynamic between those relationships and, and how that would work in a project. So thank you for that question. Just, just really quickly on, sorry, on, on that point, I mean, you're absolutely right. We, we face that as a university all the time that once we have, um, you know, sort of um, established a link with um, somebody from a company or from a, an SME, a large company or an SME, um, 
it's a lot of the, a lot of the times they do say you know finding the right person at the right time is is really challenging um and that is something that i suppose it mirrors the ktn um structure and focus is is why I, I work for the Institute for Aerospace Technology at Nottingham. Um, and we do try to be a one-stop shop. So we do try to be that, that doorway into the rest of the university so that we do the signposting and we don't expect industry partners and, and um, SME reps to, to, to find the right person first time. They can come to us and um, we signpost them and, and, and broker those links into the universities because obviously universities are, are huge organisations and um, they can be a bit of a, a labyrinth. Um, and it's something that as a university, we always have to recognise that, um, you know, this is a challenge for a lot of companies um, and we, we do try to be a one-stop shop to, to try and overcome that barrier. Thank you. And, and Tanya, I'm aware that Gary's contact details are on these slides, but obviously yours weren't. So as long as you're happy for us to, we can make sure that those details are circulated um, with the follow-up materials for this presentation. So people... Yes, of course. Yes, please get in touch if, uh, with any queries. Yes. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, so we have a COP26 um, related question from the audience here. Um, the question is, how will COP26 um, support net zero in aviation? And I suppose as well, if you have any ambitions for COP26 yourselves, um, what would you like, like to see coming out of the, the conference? Um, I'll come to Gary first on that one. Gosh, yeah, that's definitely a, a big question. So just, just a couple of thoughts. I mean, number one, I think, I think we're getting this. I think this language has changed a lot in the last few years, but uh, absolutely want to see our industry, the aviation industry being frankly, very bullish, um, absolutely driving to net zero and not trying to look like um, aviation is hard and other people go first. I think that language has changed completely. And I think you will see that at COP26, some big plans for decarbonisation, decarbonisation of aviation. So it's having, having the confidence to, to, to address that issue. I just think the other point, I'm sort of going to repeat an earlier point. Uh, I think also that COP26, and I think you'll see this, I think some of the future flight other projects are doing various events around it, just being confident that it isn't all about um, not using things. It isn't all about the kind of uh, rationing sort of mentality that, you know, we can't do anything. We absolutely can continue to introduce new products and services as well. So I hope there's just an element of we can be somewhat confident uh, in, in that we are still advancing society and decarbonising, and it's not an either or. So hopefully that comes out in some of the uh, some of the demonstrations and the stuff around the edges. Brilliant, thank you, Gary. And Tanya, do you have anything you want to share on ambitions coming up COP twenty six? Yes, absolutely. Yes, uh, as a University of Nottingham, we actually have net zero aviation as our our major. A banner theme uh, going into COP26. We have a delegation going uh, next week. Um, and I think one thing that we, we have as Nottingham is we're actually calling it a message of hope and opportunity. Um, you know, we, we obviously know that uh, over the course of, of history, you know, human endeavour has, has always, uh, you know, risen to the challenge of, of, uh, of what we're facing and uh, through collective uh, um, expertise and knowledge and, and working together, we can actually resolve um, a lot of these challenges. And I I think, um, as Gary says, you know, the sector has been under huge pressure. Obviously, it's had a major hit from uh, the COVID pandemic, and it's also had, um, obviously, a huge amount of pressure now because of the climate emergency. Um, and I think it's really, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> really important, excuse me, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. I think it's really important that there is that message of hope, um, you know, so many people are involved in decarbonising um, aviation as we speak. Um, lots of people are engaged with this. Um, and I think, you know, it really is important that um, the decarbonisation agenda is, is seen as, uh, obviously, it's a major challenge, but it's also an opportunity. Um, and it's something that, um, you know, step by step, um, it, it, is, it is being addressed. Um, and I think that message of hope is really important. Thank you. Thank you both. I, I completely agree. Um, so we have a question on future flight propulsion um, solutions. This attendee says that they seem to have focused more on battery electric um, with less hydrogen propulsion sy systems or solutions explored. Um, how do you see the UK hydrogen strategy helping to define feed infrastructure? Um, Gary, I'm not sure if you can, can pick up on that one. 
I'll have a little bit of a go at that. So for us as a future flight, we absolutely haven't uh, picked and chosen sides there. It is undoubtedly the case uh, that the bulk of things that are flying or plan to fly in, in uh, future flight are battery um, or, or uh, hydrogen fuel cell, but, but electric fundamentally. A little bit, that's just where we are because drones exist and drones are necessarily battery. So a lot of what we do is battery. We haven't expressed that preference particularly. Frankly, it is a bit clunky because uh, we sometimes will talk about the future of electric aviation. And I found myself on these kind of panels talking about the future of electric aviation brackets or other things which are lower carbon that are somewhat similar to electric. And so the more that you try to broaden things out, it gets a little bit clunky. But we are absolutely supportive of all of those things. And we have hydrogen projects in there. We're supportive of them. Uh, but the, the bulk is electric right now. On the other, it's not something um, that, that I'm, I'm intimately involved in. But there is absolutely uh, an emerging hydrogen ecosystem and there will be policies around hydrogen in the UK. I have fellow challenge directors uh, looking at industrial decarbonisation, Brian Livesey, who looks after that challenge. And absolutely one of its intents is to look at demonstration of huge hydrogen ecosystems, amongst other things. So in the UK, there is a that will be one of the themes, you know, what is the future of hydrogen? And I think we'll see much more of that coming. Uh, we will, in all honesty. We're sort of bit part players in that. We're a user of that ecosystem. We joined some panels. We're really supportive of it, but it will come from wider areas. So, yeah, lots more to come on hydrogen. Brilliant. Thank you, Gary. And from a KTM perspective, um, we have leads on hydrogen uh, within our um, colleagues and within our networks. So um, if it was something that you wanted to discuss further, then please reach out to me and, and I'd be happy to, to introduce you to those colleagues. Um, so I'm aware of time. Um, I'm going to pose one last question on the Q&A before wrapping up. Um, I'll, I'll phrase it one way for Gary and one way for, for Tanya. Uh, so Tanya, what has surprised you most in the Future Flight Challenge so far um, within your 2.0 project? Okay, I think for, for, for me, the biggest surprise is um, just how some of the partners that we, we didn't think would have, um, you know, sort of the, the, the biggest role, put it that way, because they are smaller partners, um, have actually um, <clears throat> put in perspectives that has really helped the overall partnership in terms of not just considering, um, you know, the, the hybrid electric aircraft, but really challenging us to think about the ecosystem in which it will operate. Um, and one thing that we have done, we've done it, we've actually run a series of workshops um, fo fo focusing on different challenge areas, and one is on skills. Um, and we've been really fortunate to sort of be linked into Exeter College um, and their apprenticeship program. Um, and we found that the, the issue of skills for the new aviation um, uh, system is is a, is a major one and it's something that uh, we are looking at more and more and we have actually sort of um, developed those links in with Exeter College to to really understand um, how uh, skills are developed uh, the time frame um, obviously you know we have um, aircraft um, sort of uh, company in in our consortium we have the airports and the airlines so they they have a certain time horizon in their mind but it's been really telling that we've had then um, insights about the, the skills uh, needs and also the, the time frame that will be required um, to actually develop those skills and, and to get that talent pipeline through um, to meet the timelines of the, um, the aircraft manufacturers and also the, um, the airlines and the airports as well. So um, I, I would say it was probably the, the, the skills um, agenda that, it, that is really key and has been a really um, positive development that we've seen through the, uh, through the 20 project. Brilliant. Thank you, Tanya. And I know that the Future Flight team, Gary, are, are looking into skills and, and how they can support that pipeline coming through. So it's great to see that kind of the, the awareness is picked up across the challenge. Um, so, Gary, to, to close off the, the Q&A, what has surprised you more broadly about the Future Flight Challenge? You've got an overview of all of the projects in the network. Um, so it would be great to hear your perspective on that. Yeah, and a little bit of this, this builds on what Tanya said. I mean, I think I could summarise it in kind of uh, three words. Uh, volume, diversity and speed. And it's just overwhelmingly positive. I I'm unashamedly an optimist. So uh, uh, that, that's that's kind of why I enjoy this job, I guess. Those three things are just, they knock you off your feet. They really do. So the volume first. Um, we have, um, Anna, you'll know this much better than I do, but I think regularly KTN is having conversations with of the order of 400 organisations or so in this, which is, wow, we've done uh, streamed um, 
YouTube events via KTN where we've had, you know, uh, approaching 10,000 people have watched them. So it's just, wow. So there's a lot of organizations want to play a part here. That's fantastic. Um, more is, is better in this case. The next is the diversity and, and diversity here, um, just in the types of organizations, the size of them, the age of them, the technology they bring. That's what, that, it's, it's really fascinating to watch, you know, six person software companies partnering with global internationals. Uh, uh, and it's great. I, I think more to come. We'd like to see more diversity of thinking and breadth in some of those things, but it's amazing. And the last one is um, is the speed. I mean, it really is that um, people want to go fast. You know, we if anything, people want to go faster than sometimes the systems will let us do. But you know, people are talking in months and weeks rather than years and decades in what they want to do as well. So that um, you know, that the amount of people, the different natures of people. And they just want to crack on and get things into service. It's it's massively uplifting. So the surprise for me is it's overwhelmingly positive. Brilliant, thank you. And, and I think that that kind of plays into our whole Q and A. Those two last answers on um on the hope and the drive that we have within this sector, and and the amount of organisations that want to help us deliver on on those ambitions. So thank you both. That's been a, a brilliant Q and A, uh, and and thank you because I know that it's been a slightly different dynamic with just the the two panelists. But um I think that we've had a really brilliant informative session um there. So so thank you both very much. Um. So to wrap up the session, I've just got a few final slides. If we could move on to the next one, thank you very much. So just a, a kind of overview and um, a supportive slide really. Um, obviously the deadline for phase three is looming. Um, there is the briefing event if anyone needs extra supportive um, details on, on the challenge and, and those application questions. I've got Innovate UK support at email address there. And also please reach out to us um, on the Future Flight email address if you've got any questions as well. Um, we're all here to support where we can in this um, short time that we have left with, with any application questions. Um, so next slide, please. Just to let you know that our next month's Future Flight Friday event is an Investor Insight one. This is actually a rescheduled um, event from a couple of months ago where we had a speaker um, availability challenge. It will be on November 19th, um, which is a slight change from where they normally fall in the diary on the last Friday of the month. Um, we hope that you'll all find this session really informative. It's trying to kind of pitch and support organizations past phase three, um, where we need to be, be thinking next and, and getting that investor awareness um, on the opportunities that they see within the Future Flight Challenge. And final slide, please is just kind of how you can connect with us, the normal routes for that by email, LinkedIn um, and Twitter. So I hope that you've all found this session really useful um, and enjoy the kind of coming weeks with COP26 and what comes out of that. I'd like to thank our panelists again for your time this morning. And uh, with that, I will close the event. Thank you. The world is shaping up for a revolution in aviation innovation. In the UK, businesses are already creating new, innovative, greener air transport solutions designed to offer more choice and reduce our carbon footprint. The Future Flight Challenge from UK Research and Innovation aims to create the aviation system of the future, allowing us to improve transport links between regions and in remote areas to connect people to education, jobs and healthcare. Our £125 million investment will allow the UK to build, use and export new transport technologies and be at the forefront of aviation innovation. We're bringing together industry experts to carry out research, development and demonstrations to solve mobility challenges in the UK. By encouraging innovators from a wide variety of sectors to work together, the projects we fund will help shape novel aviation approaches to enable the safe operation of radically new aircraft. Using drones to offer alternative ways of delivering goods and services, both in highly populated and remote areas. Carrying out offshore maintenance and surveillance for the renewable energy sector. The delivery of medical supplies. Surveying buildings after a fire or collapse to reduce the risk to human life. Or post-incident filming for evidence gathering. Using new and sustainable fuel sources to lower carbon emissions from advanced air mobility vehicles and electric or hybrid aircraft to help address the mobility and congestion problems in urban areas. 
and improve travel connections for rural communities where the development of ground infrastructure is difficult. These new modes of air transport will combine in a coordinated airspace where scheduled and on-demand flights work together to move people, goods and services. To enable widespread safe use of autonomous and electric air vehicles, Future Flight will bring together advanced technologies with control and regulation, physical and digital infrastructure systems, and new operating models. This new environment will be a catalyst for businesses to invest in the UK as we shape the global future of aviation and create a truly integrated aviation system. With a truly all-inclusive approach, Future Flight is transformational and will change our lives.